The Old Testament reading today is from Ezekiel 17, 22 through 24. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one. And I myself will plant it on high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. Dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the psalm is Psalm 1 today. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The epistle today is from 2 Corinthians 5, 1-10. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that, so that what is mortal may be swallow, swallowed up by life. He has prepared us for this very thing, is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we, are not, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. so that the birds of the air 
may make nests in a chair. With many such parables, he spoke to the word, he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the gospel of the Lord. Parables of the Kingdom, 
of the church, of God's people, and what our place is in the whole scheme of things as God's people, redeemed and elect. So let's take a look at the first parable, and it seems to teach that God grows his kingdom through you and me, and sometimes even despite you and me. So, there's a guy that goes out into his field. He's probably a farmer. And he goes out and spreads some seed out. And after he spreads the seed, he goes back home. And the parable says that he goes out and just continues his life. Goes to bed at night, gets up in the morning, and I will extend some of the thoughts of the parable. Uh, probably gets up in the morning and has breakfast and goes to work and conducts business and comes back home and has um, things to say and do with his family. And so basically, after the guy sowed the seeds, he went on with his life. But while this man who sowed the seeds is living his life, something very spectacular is happening invisibly underground. The seed is germinating and it's starting to grow and pretty soon it pops up to the soil. It's nice and green and it keeps on developing and it develops a stalk and the stalk keeps on growing up. Maybe it's a, it's a stalk of corn and then it has the ear or maybe it's wheat and it has the grains of wheat on the top finally, but over time it matures and it comes to the point where it's ready for harvest and then the same farmer who sowed the seed comes back and he has sickle way back then, no big combines like the wheat farmers have today, just a sickle. He goes out, maybe hires some people and they also go out and they harvest the wheat. So, one of the duties of a pastor is to preach. And in order to preach, we have to go to the Word, and we have to study the Word, understand what the Word is saying, and then apply it to everyone's lives and the life of the church. And so that's what I'm trying to do today. Sometimes it's easier than other times. Sometimes the word is pretty straightforward. Other times it takes a little bit of digging and head scratching and studying. And so the farmer or the man who spread the seed, I believe, is you and me. We're disciples of Jesus. We've been called by him through the gospel. We've been baptized. The Holy Spirit has been placed inside of us, so we're disciples. And Jesus told all his disciples to go out and spread the seed. That's part of the interpretation. The other part would be that um, as we go out and spread the seed, we aren't the most powerful part of all of this process. Sometimes we think that we are, that it all depends on us, that we've got to do it right, we've got to do it exactly. But what I see here is that the farmer, remember back to the parable, he just simply went and sowed the seeds. And then he went back to his normal life. And so when we're interpreting this parable, I think it brings up a good point. We do the work of spreading the seed, but God is the one who's working in the hearts of people He's working invisibly and imperceptibly and taking that word and causing it to powerfully work on people's lives. That guy didn't come back every day in the parable and bend down over where the seeds were and stir them up. He didn't dig them up because maybe it was so cold and put them in his hand and try to warm them up to help the seeds grow better. He didn't take all sorts of nutrients and pour them on top of the seeds. He just sowed the seeds. And he left nature 
to do its work. And so that's the way it is also, I believe, as disciples of Jesus Christ. We're out there following our Lord's command and sowing the seeds, but we're leaving the success and the powerful operation of the Spirit to God Himself. God hasn't told us to go out and to twist arms and to make sure that after we sow the seed, someone now is making a Christian confession of faith. God just wants us to go out and sow the seed. And that seed that we're sowing, it's important to know exactly what it is. It is a life of good works. So we're out there. We know God. We know His Son. We know His salvation that's pure and full and free. And that delights our hearts. It gives us hope. It gives us joy. And then we go out and live our lives. Whatever season of life we might be in, if we're working at this time, we go to our job. And we do our job unto the Lord. Joyfully. As joyfully as possible. Even sometimes under difficult circumstances. We're responsible. We're honest because we're trying to do our vocation to the glory of God. And as we do that, it's a powerful kind of seed sowing. Because a lot of people out there are not Christians. They're not joyful in their lives. Um, they're not responsible in their lives. They're just out there to basically get by. But we're here to the more, do more than just get by. We're here to serve the living Lord. And do it with joy and with vigor. And so when we see it sow seeds that way, it's going to make a difference. People are going to notice. We're going to sow seeds of faith and joy in their lives. And then imperceptibly and miraculously, God is going to work in their hearts also. And I think when we understand sowing seeds and being witnesses for Jesus Christ in this way, it takes a big load off our minds and our hearts. We think that we have to say the right thing at the right time. We have to give a uh, articulate gospel message to somebody. But oftentimes it's just being who we are in an unafraid and unembarrassed sort of way. And God does the rest. So that's the first part, the first parable of the farmer going out and sowing the seed. And then let's take a look at the second parable. In the second parable, Jesus talks about a farmer going out and sowing a mustard seed. And Jesus says in this parable that the mustard seed is the smallest of all the herbs. Well, actually, that's not true. There are other seeds that are bigger than mustard seeds, but he's using a rhetorical device here, a literary device. It's called hyper hyperbole or exaggeration to make a point. So that's one of the keys to understanding parables. It's a story with a main point, and we're not looking so much of all the little details. We're looking for the main point there. And so the main point is that the kingdom of God is sowed kind of like a mustard seed. It's a very, very small seed. But there are humongous results from the sowing of the seed. And the seed is the seed that ultimately becomes the church, the kingdom of God, God's gracious rule in people's hearts and minds here on earth. So I want to uh, kind of explore this idea of, of sowing a small seed, a very, very imperceptible seed. Just think back this year of your seed sowing efforts. 
your mustard seed sowing efforts. Um, you might maybe doing some things around here at the church. Maybe working in the office. Maybe you're a usher. Maybe you um, help with the altar guild. Maybe you help clean up sometimes. Maybe you come and help weed or there's just maybe a small little job that you do. It doesn't seem like much, but when it's done to the glory of God, with the thought that this little work doesn't seem like much to everyone else, but it's to the praise and glory of Jesus, then God can use that in some fantastic ways. This past week, I spent a lot of time in the office preparing for the service, um, helping get the bulletin ready, training a new worker in the office, and then going out and paying visits up to OHSU to visit somebody, out to Providence Hospital to visit someone who may be dying, we don't know, and then down into Southeast Portland at a nursing home where one of our members was placed there for the first time. And as I did so, I sowed gospel seeds, came there, and with one person who was on a respirator and gasping for air, put my hand on him, anointed him with oil in the name of Jesus, and prayed for his health and restoration. The other guy who's transitioning from independent living to being in a nursing home, it's a pretty huge transition if you've been close to someone who's done that. And I was just there for him, listened to him and his anxieties and his frustrations and then offered him Holy Communion and um, prayed with him. There were no TV cameras there, no reporters there taking notes and asking me why I did this and what I said and how I felt. When I looked at the paper this morning, I wasn't on the front page. It's just these little behind the scenes jobs that we do often, just living our lives to the praise and glory of God and Jesus Christ. They combine with the efforts of the church for the last 2,000 years. Jesus Christ sowed the mustard seed of his life, his death, his resurrection, his full payment for all of the sins of the world, and then his disciples, his apostles, on the heels of that, went out and sowed mustard seeds. They shared the gospel with people in other lands, and they spoke the gospel in lands where they didn't know the customs, they didn't know the language often, but they were there serving God. And it happens, it has happened ever since the apostles all the way up until today, the last 2,000 years, Christian people sowing seeds, loving God, loving their neighbors as themselves, so that today, in fulfillment of Jesus' parable, we have a huge plant in the herb garden. And the mustard seed plant can become one of the largest herbs or plants, almost a tree. There are some varieties of it that can become 10 feet tall and can actually, as the parable said, uh, grow branches and birds of every variety can find shade and rest in the branches of a mustard seed plant. And that's the church today. Church today, due to the seed planting efforts of millions of Christians and pastors and whatnot, for all intents and purposes, has about 2 billion people. It's probably the largest institution on earth. And we see various manifestations of it. There are 
congregations like this one that gather every Sunday for worship. There are hospitals that have been planted by Christian churches. There are all sorts of different Christian ministries out there under the auspices of the Kingdom of God or the Church of Jesus Christ. We have organizations that go out there and feed the poor, clothe them. We have organizations under the auspices of the church that go out and, and uh, drill wells so that people can have uh, clean drinking water. It goes on and on. And so that is the task that God has given us to do, to plant seeds and to know that God is going to use them in miraculous and wonderful ways that we can't even imagine. And to see that sometimes our efforts seem like they're very minuscule and inconsequential, but God uses them in ways that fascinate and, and totally blow our minds sometimes. When I was going to college, I worked at the General Motors plant in Fremont, California. I think it's a Tesla plant now, if I'm not mistaken, if it's still open. And my job was to take the place of workers who called in sick. So I'd be on the assembly line and maybe one night I'd be screwing in a armrest or another night I might be pounding in a dashboard in a blazer or putting on a hubcap or something like that. But I was in a certain place on the assembly line and I didn't see the, the, the uh, automobile starting to be made. I was just right there after maybe 10 or 15 other people had put different parts on the chassis and then after it left me and another one came, I didn't see the end product. I was just there for eight or nine hours putting one or two parts on, and that was it. And I was there about two years, but myself, together with hundreds of other workers, we probably put together thousands of cars. And maybe you drove in one of the cars that I put together down in Fremont, California, about longer than I want to admit. <laughs> um, and that's kind of the way it is with the kingdom. We're here at this place, at this time in history. We've been called, gathered, and enlightened by the gospel. And God is using us, together with other Christians around the world right now, and that came before us, and that will come after us. But it's going to be a glorious thing when we finally are raised from the dead on the last day when Jesus comes. And we're going to see the full complement of our work. There is going to be a huge harvest. There are going to be billions of souls that have come from Africa and India and North America and South America. And they are going to be worshiping the Lamb of God with us. And they're going to be enjoying eternity. And we can know for sure through God's Word that through our partnership, through our seed sowing, God has done a marvelous thing. And we will praise Him for this throughout eternity. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding in your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Um, together with all believers, let us confess our faith this morning and do it to the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things invisible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, begotten of his Father before all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of God, very God, begotten. By whom all things were made, who for us sin and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made a man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and 
Thank you.